So welcome to the Kemeny Lecture. This is an annual event that's organized by the Department of Mathematics. It's been running for almost 30 years. Um, and it's in honor of John G. Kemeny, who really, as you all probably know, had an outsized influence on Dartmouth College. Kemeny was a professor of mathematics at Dartmouth from 1953 until his death in 1992. His research was in logic, in combinatorics, probability, especially in the theory of Markov chains, um, and in computer science. He was president of the college from 1970 to 1981, and his legacy includes the introduction of co-education, the notorious D plan, uh, various recruitment initiatives for minority students, and the revival of Dartmouth's founding commitment to providing education for Native American students. But during his time as president, he continued to teach undergraduate math courses and published a wide variety of work in mathematics, education, and computing. Kemeny is perhaps best known as the co-inventor of the basic computer language, and he made Dartmouth a pioneer in student use of computers back in the 60s. Um, his national service included chairing the presidential commission that investigated the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island in the late 70s. And before coming to Dartmouth, Kemeny worked on the Manhattan Project under luminaries like Richard Feynman and John von Neumann, and he completed his PhD in mathematics at Princeton with Church after a time working as Albert Einstein's assistant. Today, I'm pleased to introduce uh, the Kemeny lecturer, Alex Lubutsky, who's a professor of mathematics at the Einstein Institute of Mathematics at Hebrew University and the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. Alex is a world expert in group theory and extremal graph theory, whose work has made fundamental contributions with, an ap with applications in theoretical computer science and error correcting codes, which we'll hear about today. Um, his research has been recognized by numerous international awards and grants, among them the Erdős Prize, the Rothschild Prize, the Israel Prize, a record of three European Research Council advanced grants, an invited address at the, international, at the International Congress of Mathematicians, and election to Israel Academy of Sciences and uh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Alex was also elected as a member of the Knesset, Israel's parliament. So we're very honored to have Alex here today to speak on new directions and error correcting codes. And let's give him a warm welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Asher, and uh, thank you all. Uh, I'm really very glad uh, to hear it. Somehow it was up in the air for a number of years that I should come to visit here, and eventually uh, it happened. It's nice to meet some old friends. By this, I mean old that we know for many years, not that they are old. <laughs> I am the, I'm the old part in, the, uh, in this pair. And um, um, it's, it's especially nice to come here uh, to respect the memory of uh, Kemeny, which, uh, uh, as Asher told you, I also had a little experience in politics, so I know how difficult it is. You know, we think that mathematical problems are, <laughs> are difficult, but some of real uh, world problem working with people is sometimes much more difficult, so I really have a lot of respect to people who can uh, combine both. Uh, what I want to talk today is actually mathematical problems which has to do with the real life, and, and this is about uh, some error correcting codes. Because it's a public lecture, I want to start a little bit with a background. Um, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's, it will be kind of, I, I will touch a few points uh, um, in history, and then I, go, I will go to the modern stuff. So what is error correcting code? Uh, usually, the, the, as the way we think about it these days, that we have a noisy a channel of communication. Namely, I want, you know, usually we want to send information. Nowadays, we know we, trans, we translate it to a sequence of bits. You can think of it as a sequence of zero and one. And, and, we, and we send them. So uh, uh, we send this sequence of bits. But for some reason, there are some mistakes. You know, these bits, which was zero, arrived as one. Uh, these two ones arrive, uh, arrived as, uh, was received as zeros. And the receiver 
should know how to correct it. Now, in real life, you know, if you, if you read a, a newspaper, there are many typos, many mistakes. Sometimes, but you can easily, usually you can easily correct them. Sometimes you even correct them without noticing that there was a, a, a mistake. Sometimes is, is it, but, but you know, this, this example, for example, uh, uh, if you write uh, uh, to somebody, come to my house at, sev at 1725, and he get come to my house, so he understand, he knows how to correct this, he knows how to correct this, but this is a little bit more complicated to correct, and that's, uh, let's say that he, he understand that um, um, it, it looks strange, maybe he knew that we, you're talking about dinner, and then he can maybe fix it from four to, to, se, four to 17, maybe 18, but that's okay if there will be a little misunderstanding. But if this is the amount of check between banks which have a, a, a mistakes, then uh, we, we should really have a very good uh, methods to correct them. And that's basically the, the content of error correcting code in modern information theory. But before going to the modern information theory, I want to, to say a few words where you find error correcting code in nature. And basically, uh, uh, you find it, now, nowadays we know that we have the genes and we have the DNA, you know, and the DNA are huge chains of, uh, uh, um, uh, which can be s uh, uh, written as a, uh, um, you know, uh, using the A, C, G, and T, and the, the gene is a sequence like that, which comes in pair. They all, they, it's, uh, I forgot how it's called in English, L, uh, the, 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 the double? Ellis. Ellis, double Ellis, and, a call, and they must come always that, uh, that uh, the C is, a, is against G, and the T is against, is against A. Now, when, when a cell reproduces another cell, then it's kind of open up, and, and so all the information is really inside each one of the two halves, and, they, it, and it's kind of reproduced itself or if you want to reproduce the copy of it, in the sense that, a, that C reproduce G, A reproduce T, et cetera, et cetera. Now, sometimes there are mistakes, and the, and the nature has kind of a natural error-correcting code to repair uh, mistakes. Uh, they call it a proofreading, they call it mismatch repair, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to talk about it, first of all, because I know so little about it, and secondly, because I'm afraid that there are many people here who knows much better than me. I just wanted to say that it's not a new thing, error correcting code, that in, when you pass information, there are mistakes, and you have to correct it. Actually, maybe this statement that I have to correct it, it's, it's wrong. Do we want? Do we want mistakes in such a reproduction? Well, of course we we don't want because some of of, of some of the diseases in the world are caused exactly because of mistake in the reproductions of the of the DNA. But some of them are like what we call mutations are really responsible for the diversity of the world. The fact that we have such a developed world is due to the failure of the error correcting codes. So maybe the conclusion of you will say, oh, I don't want to hear your talk because if you try to get better error correcting code, we would love to have worse error correcting code because they are responsible to our, let me take this jacket. I, when I was in politics, I was told that when I speak to a public, uh, to that I should come with a jacket and tie. I decided tie uh, will be maybe too much today. So I wanted, to, because you have to show respect to the audience, so now you, you know that I have respect to you all guys, <laughs> I can take it off. <laughs> so anyway, so this is, this is the error correcting code in nature. Now I, I, I want to tell you about error correcting code in a, something which is more surprising and much less 
known, and this is in history, or, or in literature, whatever you want. But be, before that, I should tell you a personal story. Uh, 15, uh, 17 years ago, to be more precise, I was running a program at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton for a year. I stayed there for a year. They gave me a large, fancy apartment. But my family came only for part of the time. Um, and at some point, a friend of mine came to visit me, and he stayed with me for a month. He wanted to do some, uh, some uh, research at, in the library of Princeton University. And I told him, you know, I will be there. Why stay with me? It will be fun. Um, I have a large apartment. And um, we went to the synagogue there, and, and a physicist from the Princeton University invited us to come to dinner to his, to, to his place. Uh, OK, so we came. And he asked my friend, what are you doing? So I introduced him. He didn't know my friend. And he said, I'm studying the Mesora. I even don't know how to say it in English. It's a, it's a word in Hebrew. And, in, and this is the following. He's a professor, my friend, is a professor of, of linguistic and Bible. Uh, his expertise is the Mesora, which is a very, very exotic <laughs> a subject. Even in Israel, people hardly know about that. But I tell you in a in few words what is the whole topic about. This is about, for the rabbis, for, uh, uh, you know, in Hebrew, uh, the vowels usually are coming uh, below, uh, there are some points below, when you write a text, below the, below the letter. But you can also put them as letters. So if you take a name like Jonathan, there is more than one w legitimate way to write, to, write, to write the name. In the Bible, the same person, Jonathan, can appear twice, once in one form and the other in one form, and sometimes in the, in the same chapter. For some reason, for the rabbi, it was very important it would be here like that and, and there like that. I don't understand why. I guess people who study Mesorah maybe try to explain it, but f this is not our business. What our business is that the Mesorah was a kind of a, a art, I would say, to, to how to keep the precise form of the Bible. You have to remember, we are talking about the 8th, 9th, 10th century, before people, uh, before a Xerox machine, you know, and, 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 and writers were just copying, copying, copying. Now, I come to the Jonathan, I am tired. Uh, just two lines before, I have Jonathan in this form, I see Jonathan, naturally, I'll be writing the same thing, right? So the books of the Mesorah, which I'm going to show you now, this is the most, uh, this is the most famous book of the Mesorah, uh, called Alep, uh, Aleppo Codex, the crown of Aleppo. There is a fascinating story about this specific book. I mean, when we say book, I don't mean it like we say book today that there are many copies. There is a single copy of it. It was in Syria, uh, uh, in, uh, in Aleppo, uh, uh, when, when the United Nations decided to, about the establishment of the state of Israel, then there were riots against the Jewish community. It was kept in the synagogue there by the Jewish community. There were riots. And this book disappeared. And eventually, it turns out that a, a much, a, some of it was burned, but most of it was kept by the Jews um, promote the idea that it would disappear because they were afraid that the government who understood the importance of this book will not, will not take, enable them to take it out. The Israeli Mossad, you know, the famous Mossad of Israel, was involved in bringing this book to Israel. This is the oldest text in Hebrew that exists, a, a full text. So, uh, you, you have this death code. Anyway, how, how, how this, uh, 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 how the, so this is the, the text, and you see some symbols here, signs here and there. So my, my, my friend, Yossi Offer, is ex expert exactly on this type of symbol. What is the goal of this symbol? To give some pointers and hints 
how to write correctly the text without mistake. So our friends, the physicists in Princeton, when he explained this, uh, they said, oh, I understand, error correcting code. <laughs> you see, the old Mesora, in a way, it's an error correcting code. What is an error correcting code? You, uh, the, the, the standard error correcting code is that you have a text of length k. Instead of sending k bits, you send a longer uh, 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 a, a sequence of size n, n bigger than k. The extra information teaches you how to, re how to correct, how to keep the right k word. So the Mesora, let me, let me take you to, you see, this is the way it looks like. You probably can, even if you know Hebrew, it's <laughs> not easy to read. But you see, but I just want to tell you that this is the text. One, two, three. All these uh, uh, notes uh, somewhere here, these are the addition by the, uh, we call them the people of the Mesora who put in the book so that when, peop when somebody copy it, he will make sure to do it exactly correct. I can go a, a forever and talk about that. Uh, I, I tell you frankly from personal, I got into the whole area of the, of, of, uh, of the error correcting code because of that remark of the physicist. Uh, um, you know, we are Orthodox Jews, we are crazy, we don't drive on Shabbat. So we had to walk from his place to the institute for like an hour. My friend Yossi Offer is a graduate of mathematics. He studied mathematics and linguistic, and then he went to linguistics and uh, became a professor of linguistic. But in the undergraduate studies of uh, uh, mathematics, you don't learn about er error correcting code. So I told him what is error correcting code, etc. cetera. He is, he's a brilliant guy. He got it very quickly. And then I told him, but you know, it would be extremely interesting to study the Mesora from the point of view of modern information theory to see what can we, as I said. Okay, uh, it took us several years till we came back to, to, to do it and we eventually we did it and we wrote a paper uh, which was published in, uh, in uh, the most uh, fancy uh, uh, journal of uh, Jewish studies. So you know the, right. What? No, I don't understand anything. <laughs> Even in mathematics book, I don't know. A paper, I don't know. I, I, unfortunately, this is in Hebrew. This, the, the, but my friend, a few years ago, published a book on the Mesora in English, and one of the chapters is really about that. So if I made you interested, go to the book and read it. I will be, uh, the, the reason I'm trying to do a little propaganda for that is that I talk with a friend of mine who's a professor of Indian uh, culture, and I ask him, is there something like that? And he said, yes, not exactly. Somehow I never really got to, to work with him about, on that. And I have no idea if in other culture, like in the, in the Christian Bible, is there this carefulness about the, the way to write the manuscript and what is the solution? Do they have such Mesora method? If somebody knows about that, I will be happy to learn. Okay, <laughs> so this is about uh, some kind of a general introduction. Uh, anyway, for me, it's extremely, before doing this, I knew almost nothing about error correcting codes. It became my, one of my main area of expertise only in the last, uh, I don't know, 12 or 10, 12 years because, because of that. And this I already say in order to protect myself because at the end of the lecture you will maybe ask me <laughs> questions about error correcting codes. So you have to know that I know very little about that. <laughs> okay, so now let me be uh, a little bit more about the mathematical, the modern theory of uh, error correcting codes. So these are the, the big heroes, heroes of, the, of the subject, uh, Amming and Shannon, Shannon and Amming, who kind of were the first to formulate each one in a slightly different way, and uh, each way is kind of influential up to now, what is the goal of error-correcting code as a mathematical subject. 
So the basic idea is the following. Uh, we want to send k bits. For example, I want to say four bits. Let's say I want to say 0, 1, 1, 0. Instead, we shall send n greater or equal than k bits. The extra bit will teach us how to correct errors. For example, if we want to send this these four bits, like a four bit, I can stand it's instead 12 bits. I just repeat every bit three times. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, right? Okay, now if there will be only one mistake, then for sure I can correct it, right? Because the, the, just by, uh, by majority, but majority rule. But this is not so effective, and if it be two, then I, I, I'm not sure what will happen. Uh, Eming showed his famous codes, which I, I won't go to, it's elementary, but it's, it's a nice, uh, um, uh, that you can, if, if, you, if you want to achieve that, to send four bits, such that for sure you will be, for sure, not probabilistically, you will be able to correct one mistake, it's enough to use seven bits and not 12. So there is, there is some method for to doing this. So this was kind of one of the starting point for this uh, subject. So anyway, the basic goal is to make n as small as possible with respect to k and to correct as many errors as possible, not just one. I was talking about correcting one mistake, but I want to send k to be uh, uh, 200 or 200,000, and n will be bigger, but uh, uh, there, is, there is kind of a clear fight between making n as small as possible and at the same time correcting a, as many uh, errors as possible. So the whole modern theory is really about how to encode k bits into n bits. I will not really talk so much about the encoding system and, and also, not, uh, also not about the decoding, but somehow that if there are at most d errors, then we can correct them all. And usually something like that is called NKD code. Uh, uh, there are k bits which are important. We send n instead, and we can correct d errors. Let me now uh, start to do precise mathematical uh, formulations. So let fq be a field of order q, usually q equal 2. So I know this is a public uh, talk, uh, even if you know what is the field. I'm, I'm talking now about just binaries 0 and 1. I will talk only about that. And NKD code, so now we will be more formal of what we said before, will be a subspace. We don't have to take linear subspace of F2 to the N, but it's kind of convenient of dimension K and distance at least D. What does it mean distance at least D? What is the distance of a code is the minimum of what is called the Hamming distance between any two distinct vectors in the code. We want that the distance between any word, any legitimate vectors in the code will be as large as possible. If the distance is at least d, then we can correct d over two mistakes, right? Because then if I get a vector, I know what, which one is the closest to it. And, the, and it's a unique one. So the, the word D is used, maybe, maybe we should call it D over 2 or 2D, but it doesn't matter. Uh, that's that's we call the distance. Now, if one of the convenient things that if it's, a, if it's a linear subspace, then uh, the, I, mean, I mean distance just meaning how many bits they are different. Uh, if it's a linear space, you can always take uh, the distance of uh, between alpha and beta is the same as the distance between alpha minus beta and zero, 
and then this means what, how many non-zero entries we have in alpha minus beta. What is the weight of that? So this is the same as the minimum amming weight of alpha when alpha is a non-zero vector of C. So now we are not engineers, we are mathematicians, so we are interested in the case n going to infinity. And we, and here is a, a, a definition, a code. Any time when we say a code, we mean a family of codes, like uh, uh, which means n goes to infinity, right? And we use uh, a code, but we really mean family of codes when n goes to infinity is called good. I think this term go back to Shannon. If there exists an epsilon such that k is at least epsilon times n and d is at least epsilon times n. Namely, both k and d grows linearly with n. It's not difficult to see, and I think it's intuitively pretty clear, that k and d kind of compete with each other. If you make k very, very large, it will be difficult to make d. For example, a, a simple lemma is an exercise. I think that k plus d is at most n plus 1, something like that. So you cannot really get both of them to be too large. The idea is that we want both of them to be linear in n. Uh, usually, k over n is called the rate, and the d over n is called the normalized distance, and some people just call it the distance, even though it's, it's less than one, but it's the relative distance. So c is good if both of them, rho and c and delta of c, are bounded below by some positive epsilon. So usually the, the, the terminology uh, call it constant rate and constant distance because they talk about the normalized B concept, okay? Now, it's not at all clear that codes like that do exist. It's not completely trivial. But it's already been sh shown by Shannon that random codes will be with high probability will satisfy this condition. What does it mean? You will take n goes to infinity. You take f2 to the n. And let's say that you, you will take n random uh, functionals, linear functionals. Uh, uh, they like to call it constraints on f2 to the n. Then the, the, the dimension of the set of solutions, right? We know from linear algebra, if you have n equation, you have n of, a, a dimension n, n over two equation, the dimension of the set of solution is at least n over 2. If you will take them uh, random, it will be around n over 2, more or less. Uh, but what he proved that the distance will be linear. And uh, there are uh, various, a lot of study, how good it will be, how bad. There are a lot of open problems even on this uh, connection. They, they exist. Uh, so this was Shannon. Later on, for in the last 70 years, you know, a lot of the business in our quality code is to find explicit construction with a good decoding, with encoding, with many more properties which are needed, either from practical motivation or from a, uh, that. One of them I want to mention is LDPC code. It's a terrible <laughs> name, but the computer scientists love initials. Some everything they put initials, which is uh, uh, till you get used to that. Um, a, 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 but I, I'll try to make sense of it. A code is called LDPC, low density parity check. If C is defined by equations, if you want by linear functional, if you want, call it constraints, as they like to call it, with bounded support. You remember what I said before. You take an equation, equation on x, like the bits of the, of, the, of the vectors, x1, x2, x3, up to xn. An equation, mod 2, you just, you know, you sum up some subset of them. LDPC means that I take 
all the, the defining equations to be with a bounded support. I, I'm using, I, I touch each time at most 17 places, not more. Uh, another way to say it, that if we look at C perp, namely these are all the vectors in F2 to the N which are orthogonal, I, I mean, I'm, I'm taking uh, uh, orthogonal to the code, namely this is all beta, so the beta, uh, the, the, like the inner product, you know, the scalar product between alpha and beta, everything is mod two, is zero for every alpha in C, then in C perp is generated by vectors with small support. It's the opposite than C, right? In C, in the code, we don't want to have vectors which, which, with small arming weight. In C perp, we do want, moreover, we want that it, it is spanned by vector or small support. If this happens, this is LDPC. Why LDPC is so important? In fact, Gallagher, who made this in the 60s, was ahead of his time. Nowadays, in the industry, everything is about LDPC codes. Because you see, what is LDPC? I send you, you know, I, um, I, uh, here is another remark I should make. Uh, the engineers used to laugh at us, the mathematician, that we talk about n goes to infinity. Who cares about n going to infinity? You know, it used to be that n was like 256, 128, you know, like maybe 512. So then, what does it mean n goes to infinity? But nowadays, they are talking about n equal 40,000 and maybe sometimes 200,000. That sounds, that's a little bit more like infinity in the intuition, in the mathematical method, et cetera. So, you are getting a vector of, of, of size, um, of size say, 40,000, and you want to check if, there, if it's a legitimate vector or you have to apply your algorithm to make a correction. So, what you have to check, if it satisfies all the equations. If all the equations have a small support, this means to multiply it by a matrix, by a very sparse matrix, and this computationally can be done much faster. In fact, nowadays, at some point, uh, I, I was even asked by some company to advise them. They heard that I'm doing air quality code. I couldn't really help them. <laughs> but, uh, but for them, small support really means four, five, six, maybe eight. You know, because everything like that costs money. And um, if you want to, and it should be very quickly. So, so nowadays, that's the whole point is to get n very large, but still have the equation with more support. Gallagher, who, who kind of invented the notion, showed in the 60s already that a random, co random LDPC codes are also good. Namely, if you take... LDPC, the equation with bounded weight, it's still, the set of solution is still a good code. And, um, okay, I will not say anything about that. This was the 60s, but it took so long to get explicit construction. It was maybe 30 years, was, was a major open problem. And then, uh, till a Sipser, Sipser and Spielman, this Danny, Danny Spielman that by now is a very famous uh, computer scientist, this was his uh, PhD thesis under Sipser. By the way, when, when Spielman got the Navalina Prize, which is a kind of the Fields Medal in computer science, the, the committee put this work of him as one of his three major achievements and I'm looking at my clock, but maybe I will be tempted and will give you the full proof almost of, of that. It's so simple. I don't think you can get Fields Medal for something like that, that you can show more or less with a complete proof in two slides. But, <laughs> but it was a revolution. It was, it was revolution in theory and in practice. So you, certainly it was something extremely important. So, okay, let's say first what they did, and, I, and then I will decide if to give the proof or not. 
So let X equal V, v E be an R regular graph, namely a graph such that the degree, the, the, V is the set of, of vertices, E is the set of edges, and every vertex is um, inside exactly R uh, edges. Now, the eigenvalues of, of uh, X, what is the eigenvalues of a graph? You take the adjacency matrix of it. So the adjacency matrix of a graph, if the graph has some, some point, you put them here V1 up to VL, and then V0 or V1 up to VL, and you just put 0 or 1 if they're an edge between them or not. So it's just a matrix. And now it's easy to see that if the matrix, if it's R regular, the graph, then R is an eigenvalue of this matrix. If you multiply this matrix by 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, you just add up the rows, and because it's R regular, every row is exactly R ones. So the largest, and this is the largest eigenvalue. Um, it's it's, uh, it's uh, multiplicity, multiplicity is one if and only if the graph is connected. We are going to care on the second eigenvalue. The, the, that's the, in some sense, the most important eigenvalue. We'll call it lambda of x. This is the second largest eigenvalue. And the, the x will be called lambda expander, where lambda is now some number less than r, if lambda of x is less than that lambda. Then we call it lambda expander. I expander graphs is a very, very big subject and famous subject in computer science, and nowadays also in a, a lot of issues in pure mathematics. Uh, it's sometimes defined in a different way, in a combinatorial way, but this is an equivalent way, and, and that's the one which convenient for us. And the name of the game, to get a family of expander, means that we want R to be fixed and lambda to be fixed, and the size of the graphs will go to infinity. I, and now this is also not completely clear that such graph exists, but they do exist. And in fact, a graph is called Ramanujan, Ramanujan graph, if lambda of x is less, should be really less or equal here, two square root of r minus one. Where this number come from? Why two square root of r minus one? Well, there are uh, 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 some good reasons. Alone and Bopana showed that you cannot get better than that if you take an infinite family of R. That is the wishful thinking. That's what you ought to have. Uh, uh, and to more expert, I would hint that if you take the universal cover of R regular graph, you get the R regular tree, then the spectrum of the adjacency operator on the L2 function, there is exactly in the interval between minus this number and, and plus this number. Anyway, it's completely not trivial that a Ramanujan graphs do exist, but they, they exist. The first construction was made uh, mm -hmm. by Philip Sanak and me uh, and Margulis uh, in the, already in the 80s for r equal p plus one. Notice that if r is equal p plus one, I guess it's not a complicated computation to see that two square root of r minus one is two square root p, which should ring a bell to all the number theorists who knows this number very well for Riemann hypothesis over finite fields. And in fact, the proof uses the Riemann hypothesis of finite fields, and uh, via the Ramanujan conjecture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have time, and I will not speak about that. I want to go to the Sipsper Spielman code, and I want to give you the construction, and then I'll see, and then I'll decide if I have time for the, uh, for the proof. So here is the code in one page, the code of Sipsper and Spielman, the one which is LDPC, good code. 
take x to be an R regular lambda expander graph on n vertices. Assume R is fixed, lambda fixed, and m going to infinity. We, we can get that. You remember, we can take R to be, say, p plus 1. We can get even lambda to be much smaller than R, 2 square root of a p. And we can let m go to infinity. The number of vertices will go to infinity. Now, let's see 0 be in f2 to the r. Now, f2 to the r is a fixed vector space, right? r is fixed. I take c0 to be a subspace of it. In a minute, I will tell you what are the properties of this. But it's a fix. We call it the small code. Now, label the r edges around every vertex v by the, let, by the numbers 1 up to r. So you, you look at the graph, and if you have a, ver, a here, three point, you give 1, 2, 3. Now, sorry, 1, 2, 3. And now, uh, around this point, you also label them, but you, you, do, you don't have to be consistent. This edge got here at a 3, can get here. Uh, it can get here one. It doesn't matter. Just label around every vertex the R, the R point. Okay. Let W be this, the vector space of all functions from the edges to F2. What is the dimension of this, of this space? That's clear. It's just the number of edges. The number of edges on a R regular graph on M vertices is M times R divided by 2. So th this will be the full space F2 to the N. What will be the code? In their language, the large code. It will be all the function such that F restricted to the link of V is in the small code for every vertex in D. Just think about it. I draw the picture for R equal 3, so it's a bit boring, and it's a bit too small. But if, if the function f uh, localized to a vertex v, so around it, it sees R edges. On each edge, you have a bit 0, 1. So it sees a vector of length R. You want the length R vector to be inside the small code, inside C0, the fixed code. This is, the co this is their code. What are the properties? OK, so here is the theorem. And believe me, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not a difficult th uh, uh, theorem. If the dimension of C0 is more than half of R, if the distance of C0 is more than lambda of x, this is an interesting condition, the second one, because the distance of the code is about the code. L lambda of x is about the graph. They have no connection with each other, right? If you can achieve this, then C will be LDPC code. OK, so I'll give you, uh, I'll run over the proof. Why this is LDPC? LDPC, which is usually the, the, the property which is more difficult to, to achieve, is trivial here. Because what are the conditions to be in the code that the local view of, ev of, of in every vertex is in C0? So you have to read only R, R bits at the time for that, right? So the equations are bounded. Why the dimension is, is uh, 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 of C is at least, this is an embarrassing a trivial exercise in undergraduate first year linear algebra. You count the number of variables, you count the number of equations, and you see that it works. This is the full proof what I wrote here. Now, why? Let me, instead of reading this, I will tell you very, very kind of, uh, because we are in a hurry, I will tell you the, uh, the last part of the proof why this is. So in order to be a good code, I have to prove that the dimension is good. So that was the previous one. The dimension is at most some constant times n. Now I have to explain why every function which is in the code has a very large support. So the intuition is the following. You have 
a function which is not zero. Look at one vertex. If you look at the one vertex, if it's zero, they're okay. But if it's not zero, because of the assumption that the small code as the small code is, is, is a distance at least lambda of x, it means that there are a good number of, of ones around it, not just one. Okay, if this is true for it, it's true for its neighbors also. Those neighbors for which the edge is one, the same is true for them. The same is true for, for their neighbors, only those neighbors for which you see R. So somehow you see that you start to have kind of an exponential growth. So you have to be a bit careful here, but you use some lemma of a, of a, a sorry, uh, of a long chain, which the proof of this lemma is three lines. And uh, then, and you see that under this condition, if the degree of the subgraph at every vertex is more than lambda x, then the size of it is linear, and this shows that the, the curve. That's, that's the, the full proof. I presented it as an undergraduate course with no problem. Okay. But now I, I'm starting my talk. <laughs> because in his thesis, but I will do it quickly. <laughs> in, the, in his thesis, Sips, uh, Spielman, what he really wanted to prove is what is called locally, LTC, locally testable code. Locally testable code, I, 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 oh, let, me, let me give the definition and I will say a few words about the, the general context. A code C in F to the N is called Q epsilon locally testable. Q and epsilon are fixed. If there exists a random algorithm for which if you give the, the algorithm alpha in F2 to the N, alpha reads only Q random bits of alpha. And the answer yes if alpha is in the code and the answer no if it is not in the code with probability. There might be a mistake. Uh, the probability that, that A answer no is at least this fixed epsilon, the normalized distance between alpha and the code. So to say it uh, simply, we want an algorithm. We're getting a huge code of 200,000 length. I allow you to read only 70 bits out of it. And, uh, uh, and then you have to decide if the, if the word is in the code or not. That's, of course, impossible. Uh, what you really have to decide, if the code, if the word is sufficiently close to the code. Let's say that you have an algorithm that knows to correct mistakes. But it knows to correct mistakes if the number of mistakes is, say, up to 5%. If you have 40% mistakes, then there is no way to correct them. So, but you don't want to read all the 200,000 bits to, to apply your um, uh, algorithm and then to, the, to describe that this is a completely crap and they ask the guy, send me again. You want to read very few bits and decide very quickly if it's this. Do you think it's possible or not? So the experts were in, uh, in a big debate for a good number. Oh, okay, sorry. There are codes which satisfy that. I will, I will, I will uh, because of time, I will jump. But none of these codes which satisfy them, at least which were known to satisfy them, was, was good. Namely, you want that the good uh, 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 distance and the good rate as well as local testability. Why this is such a difficult problem? Because the whole area of error correcting code, maybe not the whole, but most of the error correcting code has one big rule. The rule is the random is the best, and we try to find explicit construction that will be as good as random. Random codes are not locally testable. That's a theorem. You cannot find. So, can you find? So you see, uh, uh, usually, uh, 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 okay, may, may, there is something which called the tensor code, which I need it. Let, let, let me just, 
Uh, so there is something called Reed Solomon codes, which are, which are locally testable, but not good. Each one of the, these codes, uh, uh, usually this problem, uh, people call it, I think I gave it after that, a long uh, problem, are there locally testable code with constant number of queries? Uh, and namely, good cons uh, Q is constant as well as the other. The nickname of this problem was the CQ problem because you want constant rate, constant distance, and constant number of queries. And, uh, uh, and as I said, random LDPC even are not, are not, that's, that's can be proved. So the, usually the, the, the kind of the way to say that if you know that the random satisfy it, then, uh, and you want to find an explicit one, it's like uh, looking at the, um, at a, a stack in the in a pile of a, a stack, right? Most of them satisfy, but you have to prove it's, it's a difficult problem. Here we have to look for a needle in a haystack and not clear if the needle exists. In fact, there was a, a kind of a big dispute in the community for 30, 40 years. Some people conjectured that you cannot find them, and some people conjectured that, that there, there should be such. By the way, the intersection of these two sets of uh, scientists was not empty. <laughs> so there's a famous guy, actually, in Israel. He's a friend of mine. Uh, I would change his mind uh, along the years. And in an early uh, book of him, he conjectured they don't exist. In an in a updated version, he conjectured that they do exist. He changed his mind. Anyway, uh, let's go back. I want to just to call your attention to this tensor code because I will need them soon. Uh, the tensor code is one of the codes that people were uh, talking about. Uh, let C1 be in F2 to the N1, a smooth code, doesn't matter what is it, and C2 in F2 to the N. Actually, take N1 equal to N2 and take the same code twice. You can talk about the tensor code. You take the tensor product of them inside the tensor product of these spaces. The, the, the elementary way to think about is, is think about it that the full space is the n by n matrices satisfying such that the rows and the columns, which are n vectors, are inside some smaller code. That's called the tensor code. Now, the problem with this code is that it has a very good, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good code in the sense of the technical sense. But the number of queries is, is a, a, in order to check uh, the algorithm to check if, if a, a, the local testability is by reading a full row or a full column, and this is too many questions, it's square root question. Anyway, we'll need it soon, but it's not a solution to the problem. So let me now continue. So the work, um, uh, this is what I'm going to talk about is a joint work with Thierry Dinur, Shai Evra, Ron Livne, and Shachar Moses. And we prove, we gave an explicit construction of L, LTC good codes where Q is really constant and constant rate, constant distance. What, what is amazing happened to this problem? This problem was uh, maybe the most famous problem in error correcting code for like 30, 40 years. In the same week, that we put on the, on the archive, that paper, uh, the uh, two Russian, Pantle, Pantelev and Klatchev, also solved the problem. They came from a completely different direction. They were interested in quantum error correcting codes. They solved a major problem there. As a byproduct, they deduced this classical code. Later on, I, I don't have, I, I, I want to talk about the demo a show that you can go backward. You can take our codes also and solve the quantum code, go backward. So basically, the two works are very related, even though we kind of speak different languages. Anyway, let me just show you our construction. And for group theories, our construction might be of independent interest, and I will do it very quickly. Let's be a group, a finite group, with two a symmetric set of generators A and B, 
we will assume that uh, none of them contain the identity, and we will assume that they are somewhat uh, totally non-conjugated. They are kind of independent in the following sense. For every A and A and B and B and G and G, G to the minus one A G is not B, namely, they are no element of, uh, of A is conjugate to any element of, uh, to element of B. Assume also that the size of A, so the group G, the size will go to infinity. The size of A and B will be fixed, R. And we will assume that both Cayley graph of G with respect to A and G with respect to B are Ramanujan graphs. We don't really need it. We can do for less, but we have it, you know. I worked so hard 30 years ago, why not to use it? Okay. What? No, they have. I, I, they don't have to be Ramanujan. Okay. They have to be good expander, not just expander, but the second largest eigenvalue should be much less than R. Okay. It doesn't have to be really square root of. Now, what is a Kelly graph? Just to make sure that everyone knows, if you have a group, you take the points of the, of the, of the group as your vertices, you fix a set of generators, and for every, you multiply every element by this set of generators. This is the the Cayley graph. Now, uh, Cayley graph is all over group theory and uh, maybe other subjects for many years by now. Always, always, when we say Cayley graph, well, I say to multiply, I have to explain. Multiply from the right or multiply from the left. Why I didn't bother to explain? Because you are getting isomorphic graph. That's a little exercise. It's, they are not equal graph, they are isomorphic graph. If you take the left Cayley graph or the right Cayley graph, they are isomorphic graph. But never in the literature before, in this sense, uh, uh, people didn't take from both sides. So now I want to take G with two set of generators and multiply from one side by A and from another side by B and I want to think about it not as a one-dimensional space, but as a two-dimensional space. I want to think of it as a, a square complex. Okay, so here is the point. We call it the left-right Cayley complex. Namely, for every G, we'll multiply G by A from the left, by B from the right, and we will get such squares. Okay, now you can count how many squares you can have here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you think about this for a moment, if you look, if you look locally, what do you see around G? Fix little g. You can go by every A and by every B. So what you see around you, a matrix, R by R, right? So now, here is the code that we will take. We will take code CA in F2 to the A, and CB in F2 to the B, and C0, the tensor code, as I, talk, as I, talk, as I, as I mentioned before. So, so the tensor code will be a subspace of the, of the R by R matrices satisfying some conditions. Okay, the condition is that the, the rows should be in one code, the columns should be in, in the other code. And uh, right, we said that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the square containing G and A cross and A cross B. Now here is our code. Our code is the following: let W be all functions on the squares. Unlike Sipter and Spielman, we go one step up to squares. We talk about functions on the squares, not functions on the edges, okay? And, so, and the code will be all functions on the square such that the function restricted to the link of a vertex is inside this tensor code. So you see, it's the same philosophy like the Sipsa-Spielman, but one dimension up. 
And here's the theorem. Under suitable assumption on C, A, C, B, and R, which are technical, not so important, what we get is a good LTC code. What is the, what is the check? The check is pick a random code, a random vertex, pick a random a row or a random column and check if they satisfy. Now, before that, in the, in the tensor code, I said that it's not good. But there, eh, the, the size of the, square, of the matrices went to infinity. Here, the matrices are all R by R. What goes to infinity is only the size of the group, right? So here we are proving the local testability of the big code by a kind of local testability of the small of the small code, the local, which is just by reading R and R is fixed. So there is something to prove. I mean the proof is not as easy as Sisper and Spielman. Now because I have to finish. I will just say that all this subject is related to I-dimensional expander and Ramanujan codex in a way that tomorrow, hopefully, I will I will I will say something. Uh, those of and uh, but this is going to be a little bit more fancy mathematically. Uh, uh, those of you who are familiar with the Boatitz building and the theory of Garland, uh, uh, then I-dimensional expanders and the Boatitz building. This is, this is not needed for the recording code eventually, but this was the motivation somehow. So tomorrow I will say something about, about this and the Ramanujan complexes, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see, think of all this also as an introduction for the talk tomorrow. So, okay, I think better I should finish it. Want to take? You want to take? Uh, my two generator sets. I'm either going to take the end cycles, yeah. right, and of them, or right. take pairwise adjacent. Yeah. Right. So those are okay. The, the I mean, so pairwise adjacent, they're not uh, good expanders. Right. So that's what, that's what I was curious about. I mean, so right. you, you get something, but it's just not good. Right. They're not. The right. Right. No. I mean, you need the you need this property in order. To, not not the good. The good is just the, it's just like Sipser and Spielman. Mm -hmm. the, the, to get the do, local testability, you have to work harder, and then you need that both sides will be expanded. By the way, the fact that they are not conjugate with each other, this is not so crucial. Uh, we, you, we can omit it. I mean, even if you take the same set of, from both sides, I think the proof should work. Um, a little bit more. Uh, with, with may, maybe a little bit should be. It was convenient for us to assume that because it made the proof more. Uh, but I think I don't remember if we really eventually wrote the proof that it, uh, to ourselves that it works or we just believe that it works. That's not the crucial issue. The crucial issue is that they both sides should be expander. The Cayley graph with respect to the left should be expander. The Cayley graph very good expander. Sorry, and then and 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 how does the result depend on the size of the generating set? They, they have to be fixed. Okay. They even don't have to be equal if you if you don't want. But so, like for these groups, whatever SL two over finite. Right, that, that's that's what we are using for the we have explicit construction. We are taking SL two P SL two Q yeah. with two different set of generators. We know to produce many pairs and just many. Many, uh, okay. yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Generating sets on two elements. No, no, not two right? elements. No, no, no. We need, uh, no, no. We need. It's kind of important that our, at least for other proof, that our will not be that small. It's fixed, but it's not that small. Okay. All right. 
Um, I don't remember, but, but you can really go and even uh, check what is the minimal one. It's explicit construction. It's really explicit eventually, but we didn't bother to 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 check. But and did you implement it? Did someone no, implement it? No, uh, no, no, not you. Uh, no, I, I don't know. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> you are welcome to write a patent on it. Okay. I, uh, no, we, we didn't. I tell you the truth, my, our feeling is that uh, just like what happened to us with the Ramanujan graph and everything, uh, so that, 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 that it's the first step, I mean, it's, I'm proud to say it's even a breakthrough, you know. We already got some prizes for that. <laughs> but uh, it's clearly the kind of thing that something will come up eventually with some probably better and uh, muter, you know. It will take some time, things like that, to improve himself. So, but it's very elegant mathematically in the sense that it's scaling. You don't need it if you really go to the proof. You know, we add it, so why not to use it? But uh, but if you were trying to send messages of length two hundred thousand, would you use this? Would it be useful? I, I tell you, at some point, some company wanted me to come. I used to come from time to time to advise. And then I realized that uh, uh, when we say constant and when they yes. say constant, there are, so for me, R is constant. Yes. Right? But I don't care if the constant is 400 or 4,000. Sure. For them, they, they usually 4, 5, 6. They told me, you know, if there would be extraordinary achievement, we can allow you 8. And then I noticed that I couldn't do. I mean, they, didn't, they were not interested in LTC. They were interested in other property, but then I saw it's like working with your hands tied if they really want you to, but you have to understand for them to, to, to make R slightly larger means to put more data. That's what I mean. So, I mean, if, so if R were eight, if R were eight. If R were eight, this and, was, and, and uh, that's down. probably would be terrific for them. But I don't think we are there. Um, I remember once I, I made another work on error creating codes with a constant or something else that we constructed explicitly some symmetric, whatever it means, codes. And I gave a talk in Noga Alon seminar. And then, and there it was very explicit. The constant, the, the number of edges was uh, 4,012, something like that. I needed a number with some peculiar. And then someone in the audience, an older guy, which I never met before, uh, ask me, can you make this number down? You know, as mathematicians, we don't care. And then people told me after, oh, I was very polite and answered him very politely, but they told me, you have to, to, you have to listen to him and you had to think about this problem. This is the guy who made the error creating codes for, uh, in Israel we call it a disk on key. Uh, what you call the uh, U, 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 USB, UBS, you know, the one which you put on the end. And he's a, he's a millionaire just from the fact that this was invented in Israel, and they hired him to do the error quality code, and he got some percentage. And every time you buy something like that, he's getting few that. So if, you, if he asks you a problem, you better listen to him. <laughs> But uh, I learned my lesson. I mean, it's a different world to do the real world. I mean, it's, it's a very interesting challenge. I'm not, but it's a different way of thinking when you work like that, when with constant mean very small constant. So also here, I don't think, I think I can calculate what is the minimal R that will work for us, but I bet it will be in the, in the best case, will be in the hundreds or thousands, uh, maybe hundreds. You know, I, have to, I have to think about it. Maybe we have time for another question. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I got this right, but you said that uh, quantum Could you use the codes in the respect uh, that we have mentioned them are not better than your tensor codes. Are, are not? Are not better, are not better than your tensor codes. Uh, I guess, uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert. I know a little bit about quantum codes, but not so much. Um, you see, uh, it's not clear what you mean by better here. For them, at, at least in the way the industry and the theory there goes, 
they, need, they want at this point much less because their error correcting codes is the name of the game. That's the most important thing. You see, the problem with quantum computation is that there are so many mistakes that you have to correct all the time that uh, for a good number of years, the leading, um, the leading uh, uh, quantum uh, code was uh, the so-called Tory codes or, uh, or some, and I mean, sometimes if you, if, you, if you have to pay 50 bits for correcting one bit, it's considered as a good ratio for them because they really care about the correction and at this point much less about the kind of goodness and about the local testability and about, about that. But the theory, the problem that I mentioned before that the two Russian guys solved was doing LDPC good quantum code. It's still, a, now they want to go a step further, but that's only for theory. For practice, they talking about much less. LTC, locally testable quantum code, is still a major open problem. So what they did now, LDPC, is a quantum analog for what Sips uh, and Spillman did in the 90s. So 30 years after, they solved it for the quantum codes, the analogous uh, results. We'll see how much time it will take to solve the LTC. If they exist, you see, it's not clear that they exist. Just like this code, it's only by the existed construction, not by random arguments. So we'll see. One more question. All right. So just looking at your sort of tensor code-based construction, it looks very similar to Spielman's original code. To what? Where, uh, to Spielman? Or uh, I'm yeah. probably getting the name wrong. But, no, Spielman um, and Sipson, yeah? Sip, yeah. Um, so we're like, I mean, conceivably you could sort of look at the expander graph that they used as a, as a Ramanujan graph. You take B equal to like the set containing the, um, like the identity element, and you take A to be your sort of favorite generator from the Kaler graph. And it looks like your construction can specialize uh, to theirs. It specialized to their in the following sense, that we, we have a small code and we have a large code. So to the proof that it's good, and it's almost identical to their proof, the new point, which I didn't show you, is to prove that it's locally testable. Which, uh, the LDPC is just like there. Uh, so it's, it, if you want, it's a spatial case of, of a Sipsis Pillman built, instead of building it on a graph, is built on a two-dimensional. But our all idea, which we work on this very hard for like five years, was, and I try to, I will try, I hope I will have a chance to get to that tomorrow, that local testability is an higher dimensional phenomenon. It's not, it cannot exist in, in, in a dimension one. You need a second dimension for that. Right, I, I was wondering if there's a way to make codes by taking three sets A, B, and C insisting on a non-solution to a bunch of word problems and then building three tensors, and, and then you have some sort of Cayley complex of, you know, supported in dimension three. Right, I mean, I don't know. I mean, we don't know if even in this can be generalized to three dimension, because you see, we do left and right. A group has only two sides. There is no <laughs> bottom and up. And now, can you do a, a now, I, uh, you see, here you have an action. You, one way to think about it is that the group is acting on itself from one side and from another, and the two actions commute with each other. I think it's possible to prove that there are no, it's impossible for a group to act on itself three times such that every two actions commute unless the group is a billion. And, but then it's not an expander. So it's not clear to me how to generalize this to dimension three right away. The Ramanujan complexes, which I will talk about, might be candidate uh, if you want uh, to generalize it. At this point, I don't see any 
big motivation to do exactly that. I see motivation to do I dimensional expander, and that's I will talk tomorrow. Thank you very much.